And we're set. Hello, everybody. Uh, most of you know who I am. Uh, if you don't, I'm Nicolas Dionisopoulos. I am the author of Akiba Backup and Admin Tools, and I'm here today to talk to you about a subject that I hold very dear, and that is security, and uh, in fact, security of updates. So imagine this scenario. You have your site, uh, you go to the back end, you see that an update is available for Joomla or an extension. Uh, you say, okay, good. You just click update. The update is installed. And a few hours later, you discover that you're hacked. And you wonder, how the hell did that happen? I just installed an update. I should be protected. Well, the thing is that you should be protected, except that how the updates work is not entirely secure. So let's see how the updates actually work. It goes a bit like this. Your site, through the internet, goes to Joomla.org and say, hey, can you please give me a list of all the updates that are available right now for me? And Joomla.org responds, OK, there you go. This is the XML list of all the updates that are available. And uh, these are all the versions, uh, the PHP compatibility, whatever. And this is the location you download it from. Your site says, hmm, OK, I can see that there is a version newer than the one that I'm currently on. So I will have to tell uh, my user that there is an update, at which point you say, OK, install the updates. And your site thinks, all right, I have to download and install the update. So there it goes over the internet, back to the download server, which might not be Joomla.org. Currently, it's not Joomla.org, it's GitHub. It's the update server that was specified in the XML update file. And it says, OK. I want you to give me this file that the XML update claims that it's uh, the newest version of Joomla. Of course, the download server uh, has absolutely no problem. It just sends whatever file back to your site. Here's a, the, the zip file that you need to, in, to install the update. And your site says, awesome, I am going to overwrite myself with the contents of this zip file. Did you see anything missing? Validation. Yes. I have trust issues with your code. I do not trust it. And I do not trust it because there are several points of failure regarding security. First of all, it is the update source, the XML file. This is the one single point of truth that tells us which is the latest version and where to download it from. However, the integrity of that XML file is not verified. All we have right now is a list of known locations for those XML files and the ability for the user to specify any random location they please. Also, the integrity of the downloaded packets is not verified. If the XML update stream claims that I can go to this server and download this zip file, and it contains Joomla version whatever, your site believes it. It doesn't try to, to verify if that's the truth or not. You will say, but HTTPS, right? We're using HTTPS for all of our updates, the XML, the, uh, the downloads, and everything, right? If we use HTTPS, we're secure. No, not really. Uh, for starters, you have uh, three different transport layers in Joomla to download files, which are used automatically by the updater. Uh, they are JHTTP transport um, fopen, JHTTP transport curl and the HTTP transport socket. Two of them 
support SSL, say it's the B transport socket, doesn't verify the SSL certificate at all. And uh, you should actually remove it. The other <coughs> adapter of the three, HTTP transport stream, so, which uses FOPEN, uh, does not verify the host. It only verifies that there is a valid SSL certificate for any host. So if I go to Let's Encrypt and I have uh, the site hackme.com, I can issue a valid SSL certificate for that site and then I can do a man, a man in the middle attack hoping that you are on a crap host that doesn't use curl therefore Joomla falls back to JHTTP transport stream so I can now send you any file that I please with any code that I want which will be installed on your site by your site overriding itself um, and even if you have the most secure, which is HTTP transport curl, it is still possible for a sophisticated hacker to spoof the SSL certificate, either because they have uh, uh, managed to con a certificate authority to issue them a certificate, which is not very uncommon, as you remember. Uh, Symantec got, got uh, in really hot water with uh, Google because uh, their uh, validation method kind of sucks. Uh, yeah, so basically you have a lot of commercial certificate authorities which accidentally issued certificates for, um, uh, for sites that they shouldn't. So if you have that SSL certificate, it's perfectly valid and it's under your control not under the control of the, of the actual owner of the site. So let's see a few attack vectors uh, based on what Joomla does and doesn't do in order to install core updates. There you go. For starters, the user can be come to use a malicious update XML source <coughs> through phishing. Uh, if someone, uh, I mean, you know that Joomla doesn't really send any emails and the emails <coughs> it sends don't look like anything. There is no branding. Any plain text email can claim that it is sent from Joomla.org and users do not really understand that someone can send an email from any address they want without validation. They might get a warning from uh, Gmail or whatever they're using that this is uh, phishing, but not always. So someone can say, hey, we're from Joomla.org and because we're doing uh, uh, some kind of improvement in our software, you have to go to the back end of your site and uh, go to extensions, Joomla update options, uh, click custom uh, update source and enter this URL. So now, if, if anyone falls for that, even if it's like 1% of the users, those users will be installing the code that is under my control. So I have completely owned them and they have no idea. Um, I can also uh, send them a malicious update zip or I can write a legitimate looking post somewhere that points them to a malicious update zip and tell them, oh yeah, you have that problem? That's a huge bug in Joomla 3.7.2 you should install this zip file that has the path. And here's how to do it. And the user will do it because they don't know any better and they're hacked. This is spare phishing, yeah? All right, I think a more even likely scenario is that they get the zip from this uh, uh, where site in Russia where they think that they can get that. We'll, we'll, we'll get to worse no, later. No. Don't jump the shark yet. Um, if we are a more sophisticated attacker. We can do, as I explained, DNS poisoning and SSL spoofing and hijack the updates. Um, and this is exactly the kind of hacking that you would do if you are a state actor and you have a pesky dissident that you want to hack without them knowing. Or if you are one of those uh, black hat um, um, 
security contractors which are hired by companies to, to get rid of uh, annoying people. I won't say any specific examples, but you have seen what happens with certain uh, pipelines across the pond. Probably, it can be just a very simple case of scrub. Like you have a host or a service which is automatically up applying updates to your site, and if uh, they get targeted, then all the thousands of sites that are under their control <laughs> are immediately and instantly hacked. This is kind of a doomsday scenario, but it's not far off, especially as we move towards more and more and more automated update installation. And of course, we have the worst scenario of all, which is that uh, a very sophisticated attacker manages to poison the downloads or the XML update stream uh, directly on our own properties, like on, uh, on, on our Joomla.org sites or on our CDNs or on GitHub. Um, and they take over. George? Thank you. Um, so the attacker takes over our infrastructure, even temporarily, which means that we are no longer in control of our updates. They are in control and they can do whatever. And the thing is that Joomla gets all the blame because from the perspective of the site owner, it was Joomla that distributed the malicious code. Um, yeah. Did we lose internet? Okay, there you go. So, this is not a Joomla specific issue. This is something that happens in other CMS. WordPress last year had a, a, a major flow in delivering uh, automatic updates. Uh, because of the way they were they were doing some GitHub hooks and stuff, uh, that was uh, uh, explained in a very lengthy article by Wordfence. Uh, they patched it, but basically, they were vulnerable to any third party who could inject malicious code in, into their updates. Linux distributions uh, 12 years ago had a similar issue because they were signing their packages, but they were not signing their metadata like our XML update stream, which meant that someone could point a user to a malicious update source, malicious packages, install a, a, an advanced persistent threat on their, on their uh, computer, and they would be none the wiser. Uh, this is an issue that was solved uh, about 10 years ago by doing something very simple, which is sign the metadata. If you uh, if you download a list of updates, you know if it's legitimate or not. Um, Drupal uh, seems to have similar challenges, which are currently being discussed on an open thread as part of automatic updates. And their main concern is what happens if someone takes over our updates infrastructure since we do not validate updates in any other way. Are we automatically hacking, uh, letting someone to automatically hack sites? Um, The pearls of having the presentation online. Right, is there more list items in this? Is list items, two list items, or when the lines there, when it's not. Okay. That might be the problem. Yeah. When it loses connection, it, it just that doesn't show the next slide. So, how can we improve the update integrity? How can we protect Joomla users against malicious actors, against uh, hackers? We can do that with cryptographic signing. So let's get a bird's eye view of, of cryptographic signing. How many of you are familiar with it? Very few. Good. So it is based on public key cryptography, which is a very fancy way to say that there are advanced mathematics involved there. And essentially, you have two things, something that you call a private key that you only know and something that's a public key that everybody has. When I encrypt something with my private key, you can decrypt it with my public key and vice versa. 
If I encrypt it with, the, with a private key, I cannot decrypt it with it. You can only decrypt it with the public key. So this is why it's called asymmetric cryptography. Therefore, if you want to, to validate that uh, a message came from me, all I have to do is uh, take a hash, like it's a bad hash, but I will use it as an example, SHA1 of my message, and then encrypt that hash with my private key. This means that you get my message, you get that encrypted hash, which is called a signature, <coughs> and you have my public key. So now you can calculate the hash of my message, decrypt the signature, and compare that decrypted signature with the hash you calculated. If it's different, the message has been tampered. You cannot trust it, it didn't come from me. There is a conspiracy. Someone is trying to hack you. As always. <laughs> As always. This method of signature is called has then sign and cryptographers which are far more smart than I do and they, they know all the mathematics that uh, I completely ignore because it's not my thing. Uh, they, they argue that this is the most secure way to do it. I have to trust them. There you go. Uh, how do you do cryptographic signing in PHP? In versions 5 something to 7.1, the only option you have is RSA, which is uh, based on OpenSSL. Nobody uses use mcrypt because mcrypt has been dead since 5.3, essentially. Or if you want to install an extra extension in, in PHP 5.6 and later, there is uh, uh, the Sodium library, which is an interface to SALT, written as NACL. Um, the difference is that RSA is the same kind of cryptography that is currently being used by all HTTPS sites. It is an, an older mathematical model. Uh, we know for a fact that uh, Small key sizes up to 1024 bits can be cracked right now. 2048 bits have another 10 years or so before they will be easily cracked by advanced threads. So this is something that we can use in the near future. Sodium is using an even more complicated uh, uh, form of mathematics called elliptic curves. Uh, this is um, projected to be secure for the next 40 years all of that assuming that we're not going to be having quantum computers anytime soon, because then we're just screwed. In PHP 7.2 has uh, libsodium implemented, included in the core. It is the first programming language in history that has modern advanced crypto out of the box. <coughs> and of course, PHP 7.2 is something that we will not be able to use for another seven to 10 years because shared hosting. So let's say that we want to use RSA. You might be tempted to say, I can read the PHP manual and implement it myself. Don't. Do not roll your own crypto, it will be cracked. Guilty as charged. I've done that. And of course a cryptanalyst when went ahead, analyzed my code, and said, dude, you actually have a, a security vulnerability here, um, which is called Padding Oracle. I was like, OK, the only Oracle I know is the Oracle of Delphi. Can you please elaborate? He did. I was like, oh shit. I really shouldn't have rolled my own crypto. He said, no. Trust cryptographers to do it for you. So don't roll your own crypto. So what can you do? Well. Uh, for the upcoming, let's say, major version of Joomla for X, we can use a library called EasyRSA, which is itself a wrapper around PHP Seglib, which is currently considered the golden standard for doing RSA cryptography in PHP. Uh, you don't need to know how it works, you just need to know how to use it, and you can trust it that it's doing the right thing. 
perfect. For the future major version of Joomla 5x, which will be with us in, let's say, six years, uh, we can very easily use uh, Halite, which is using Libsodium that's included in PSP 7.2 and later. Because by the time we get to Joomla 5, PHP 7.2 will be end of life for a couple of years. So we can easily say that it's the, the lowest requirement for that version of Joomla. I'm trying to change the slide. There, okay. So now that we know that we can sign stuff, what do we need to sign? I would say that we need to sign two different things. First of all, we need to sign the packages themselves. Uh, we need to sign this, the zip archive. So when you try to install an update through a zip file, even directly, Joomla can verify that this is the real deal and not uh, someone's attempt to hack you. Zip files are, have a very interesting property, which is called the zip file comment. At the very end of the zip file, you have two bytes, which is the length of the comment, and then you can have up to 65 kilobytes of free data, whatever format you want. Um, this means that I can take the entire zip file that has currently no comment, sign it, and then as put that signature as a zip file comment at the end of the file. So I have my packets and my signature in one neat file. Perfect, right? Problem solved. But you also need to sign the metadata. Remember a few slides ago when I talked about Linux distributions 10 years ago, how uh, they had a big security issue because they didn't sign their metadata? Yeah, since we're, we, we will be trying to make updates secure in Joomla, we should make sure that we're not repeating uh, an issue from 10 years ago. So all we need to do is sign the XML update information itself. And we can normalize the XML in a very predictable way, create a signature, and then add that signature as an XML attribute to the root node. When I want to validate the signature, I can just remove the attribute, normalize the XML, calculate the hash, and then compare it to the signature. So this is a solved problem, right? And from the user's perspective, if the update stream or the update packets fails the signature verification, we should show a big red warning. Hey, you're about to install something that doesn't come from Joomla. Do you want to get hacked? Yes? No. <laughs> no. I don't want to get hacked, please. So. Problem solved, you, you have saved most of the users from themselves. Of course, there will always be the idiots who will say, yes, I want to get hacked. Hopefully, most of those people are in this room and we know what we're doing and we're only installing these kind of zip files because we're testing uh, something uh, like a, a, a new RC version of Joomla or, or something like that, that hasn't still uh, made it to, um, to one of the official update streams. Yes, Marco? Uh, at the risk of you telling you about it uh, in the future, what I see as a very big added value if we were to do this, that if we would have like a centralized library where you could find these signatures also for previous extensions, you would at least... We'll get there. That's what I was afraid of. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll, wait. Wait. we'll get there. Yeah. The, the thing is that uh, when you're talking about up updates and uh, cryptography and all of that, it, it's a chicken and egg problem. So you have all those interdependent ideas, but you have to, to start unraveling the yarn from somewhere. Yeah. So the easy way to, to start unraveling the yarn is core updates and then go to, to the more complicated bits, which is extensions. So yeah, I'm waiting. Come on. You can do it. You can show the next slide. Yes. <laughs> very, very important is how you sign the updates. 
Of course, if someone gets your master key, it's game over because they can sign everything as you and nobody can trust you, right? Okay, so here's the deal. You need to do what they always do in, um, in fantasy novels. You take the magic crown, you cut it into pieces, and you spread it across the seven corners of the kingdom. In modern terms, this means that you have the master key, which is offline at all times, and you have the physical media distributed to people across the world, but they only have the key, they do not have the, the passphrase to unlock it. The passphrase to unlock it is distributed to other people. Uh, so nobody can really steal the entire master key unless they start tracking down and uh, hunting uh, uh, your volunteers. But I think that if we reach that point, uh, writing free software will be the least of our worries. <laughs> when you are about to sign something, you need to use an air gap and secure computer. Air gap means that it never gets online ever. You epoxy the, the network uh, port, you remove the, the wireless adapter, there is no way to get online. You get the files there on a USB stick, you sign them, put them back on the USB stick, and then you take that USB stick to your main computer and, and upload everything. And this should be handed over physically to its release manager. And before you say, but this is so much work, um, we have these events where the release managers are always attending, paid by the project, so it's very easy for them to just hand over a laptop. Not really a problem. So the thing is that you're not going to be signing everything with your master key. Because if something happens, you need to be able to revoke the signing key and say, it has been stolen. The, um, the, the NSA intercepted me at the airport. They read, I assume they read the contents of my air gap computer. So everything in there is compromised. We need to revoke that and create a, a new signing key. But how can you trust the revocation? If the NSA has your master key and you're using it to sign your updates, then they can say that you revoke your master key and have their own master key. Yes. Uh, now we are back at, this, at square one. So the solution to that is that your master key is your master key. You do not use it to sign anything except the, your signing key, the intermediate key. So if you need to revoke it, you sign the revocation certificate with your master key. So the NSA or GCHQ or whoever cannot claim that uh, your key is revoked. You can only claim that. And you can also sign your new key with the master key. So there is a, a continued chain of trust. This is how all certificate, certification authorities work. When you order an SSL certificate, it is not signed by the root. It is not signed by the root certificate that you have installed on your computer. It is signed by the intermediate certification authority. This is exactly what we're talking about. Um, and I would say if you want to go one step further, then uh, you can encrypt your, in, your signing certificate, that intermediate certificate, with uh, your own PGP key, whose uh, private key is also offline, is inside a smart card. I always have with me my YubiKey 4, which contains the secret key to my uh, GPG key. And it is protected by a pin. I use it to sign all of my code that I commit, and I use it to sign all of the releases that, that I am making on GitHub. Um, and you can know that when I have some code signed, that code has come from myself because nobody has that key. It's on, on my person all the time, and nobody has that pin. So even if someone steals it from me, they cannot use it. You might think that this is a bit paranoid. And I would agree with you before 2013. Do you remember what happened in 2013? Snowden. Our conspiracy theory that the NSA is out to hack every single one of us was proven as a fact. 
in the next few years, we found out that all those crazy theories that we discussed are standard business practice for spooks. Last year, we found out that intelli the intelligence community is actively trying to hack all secure communications. So this is paranoid, but this is healthy paranoia because they are out to get us. There are no two ways about it. And this is why secure updates are very important. They are out to get us. After all, we are responsible for the security of millions of sites. It's 3% of the internet. We're not just responsible for the security of our own blog where we post cat pictures, if we even use Joomla. There is more. It's not supposed to end here. Suspense. Dun, 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 dun. Improving the code integrity. Because so far we have seen how we can protect our users from malicious actors. Now let's see how we can protect them from ourselves, from our own mistakes. Is the code that we have really working? Um, first of all, let's consider this. Any line of code that we commit to Joomla has a consequence on millions of sites. Right now, the commit process treats user interface changes and library code in the same way. And I like to call this process YOLO CMS. You never know what will happen. Two people will say it's OK. If it is a user interface change, it's very easy for two random people on the internet to literally just install the patch, follow the test instructions, and tell you if this fix works or not, or if it breaks anything else. If it is a library change, they can't. The number of people who can tell you if a library change is going to kill something uh, is, I don't know, seven, eight? Half of us are here. So I would say that the first thing we need to institute is code review by developers for anything that touches library code. And I see Michael being very enthusiastic about it. Yes. Ask the community to volunteer. Hi. I'm here. There, there are many of us extension developers who know the internals of Joomla. And we understand that it's in our best interest that Joomla doesn't break shit all the time. We don't want another Joomla 3.7.0. We don't need another Joomla 3.4.0. We don't need another .o release that something very important and basic broke because someone tried to fix something but they screwed up and the two people who went there to check that code only check to see if it fixes the problem he claims he fixed, not if it breaks anything else. So don't be afraid, ask the community to volunteer. We actually want to do that. We want Joomla to succeed, we depend on it. And when it comes to major features, uh, what we see is that Someone goes ahead, writes a crap ton of code, and then they say, OK, this is the code. Suddenly, there is a never-ending thread with a million messages about, why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? Uh, it wouldn't be better if you do it the other way. And uh, have you thought about this other thing? These comments are called specifications. Specifications come before writing the code, not after. So major new features have to be spec'd out. And they have to be tested against the specification. What I've said so far is common sense. I do not know how we have reached the point that we need to discuss common sense. And even so, because in private conversations, we all agree that this is common sense. There is some kind of process breakdown. So let's solve that. Let's apply common sense. 
let's make Joomla great again. And are you give sure, us a are you sure yes, I'm, I'm pretty sure that this is not going to be in the next slide. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, 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 tell me. Tell okay, me. so as far as specs, uh, yes. within the Joomla X project, there's an initiative to talk about formalizing that more. Uh, catch on to me on that. It's not set in stone, but it's, I think, the way okay. forward to formalize the APIs and stuff, to do that work up front so that you don't have the discussions. Marco, oh. Joomla X is a, is a framework project. It's not a CMS project. No, but it, yeah, okay. it's uh, in that context. Yeah, and you, 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 you're, you're trying to write a framework, and then you're trying to rewrite the CMS on it. So this is a long-term project. I'm talking about, I'm, I'm, I'm talking, sorry, I'm talking yeah, about the... This is, this is not about the project itself. It's in that umbrella, but it's specifically yeah. targeting at specifications, APIs, okay, stuff like that. Okay, we can, we can discuss about yeah. that later. Um, so to, to, to close the, the chapter of uh, is your code really working, uh, I know that we're testing code, we're testing library changes and new features and everything on sterile environments locally, which is absolutely not what a real world site on a real world hosting looks like. If you want to, to be sure that whatever you're developing, the, the next minor or major version is actually going to work for people, um, ask people to to test it on real world sites, on copies of real world sites that are that are, excuse me, that are on real world hosting, and they use real world extensions. Yeah. That's what the CMS release team does. Um, so for three seven zero, we actually had, uh, and there's only a few people in it. I I, we I know. I, a lot of sites let, let me tell you, I know for a fact that uh, the release team did not test Joomla 3.7.0 with the most, uh, with a top rated Joomla extension. Because, very simply, the top Joomla extension, the, the top rated Joomla extension, extension right now and for several years has been Akiba Baka. And as Joomla 3.7.0 was released, Akiba Backup was broken. Its frontend backup was broken, uh, CLI was broken, and I spent three weeks trying to work around Joomla. So, the, I know that the release team is trying to do that, uh, but you need a more formalized process. No, totally, and that's why I've been doing all this <coughs> weekend, which will be put out quite soon, whereby any developer can sign up and we can go through a process of making sure that every single alpha beta release mm -hmm. has been tested by that developer and hopefully give resources for us to do it. That's, so that that, do that's, that's another that. discussion that we can have later because you should not put the onus on the developer to make sure that you have not broken basic APIs if you want to claim that you're following semantic versioning. No, we still need to test. Yeah, that's why I'm saying test with real world sites. It's, yeah. it's very simple to say our list team has 10 members, we're all using Joomla. Hopefully, we have uh, those complicated client sites that use a crap ton of extensions that are very intricately uh, bound together. So we're going to take a copy of that site, apply the new version, and make sure that it's working. For more, find me after the presentation and we can discuss about this. Yeah, work. <laughs> it doesn't. Please. Please. <laughs> <laughs> This, this, it is an Italian computer. I think I have to learn Italian. How do, you, do I say please in Italian? Sorry? How do I say please? Per favore. Per favore. Okay, so <laughs> code, code attribution. This is an important topic. Um, attribution is very important, especially if uh, uh, six months later or a year later, you found out that a very simple commit that it was supposed to fix a language string error introduced a backdoor. Uh, then I will go back to Robert and tell him, why did you commit that? And he'll say, because two people tested it and they found it to be working. And I would say, well, you're right, but the, 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 this, this person introduced a security issue willingly. Did they? Did they? We don't know. We trust GitHub that they did. 
at GitHub. Is it really the single point of truth? Radek? If you do that again, I will confiscate your phone. You are not right. So, uh, when you download the slides, you can follow that link. It's actually a very interesting story written uh, several, several years ago about how uh, someone could hijack your uh, GitHub account and wreak havoc in your repository, introduce a, a backdoor, and then you get all the blame. Because nobody can tell that it wasn't you. And remember, Git, all it needs is, is an email address to, to give attribution. Um, so one way to make sure that we have proper code attribution is to sign your commits using your CPG key. It's very easy to set up. Anybody can do it. Uh, optional, but highly recommended, is to store the private key of your CPG key in a smart card like my YubiKey 4. This is what I'm doing. So someone who steals your computer cannot submit code signed as you. Per favore. It doesn't work. Yeah. Right now, we have a small issue. Our code is reviewed, and the, the two places that we keep this information is the issue tracker and GitHub. GitHub is a startup still. What happens if GitHub uh, goes bankrupt? We are losing all that information, this code. We know who committed it. We might know who contributed it, depending on how the commit was done. But we will have no freaking clue who reviewed it. Yeah, who reviewed it? Reviews. We know who committed it. We know who wrote it. Who reviewed it? Uh, the, the Git SCM project recommends adding trailer lines. In your, uh, in your commit message, you can add reviewed dash by column and have the name and email address of the reviewer, just like you would do with a sign off to, to have attribution. So now you have that information back into your repository. And I would say that you need to do that by default. Uh, at the bare minimum, you have to sign your release tags because then you know that the person who was responsible for releasing Joomla actually made the release themselves. So far, only George has ever signed release tags. So please, a round of applause for George. <laughs> well done, mate. He knows he will be playing anyway, so it doesn't matter. Yeah, but now he signs it, so yeah, he yeah, does I, get the, no, the blame. So, better. Sign all the feature merges that you're doing. Take responsibility. You are merging code. I mean, if you have commit rights, we trust you to be a responsible adult and know what you're merging, right? So sign your merge. Say, yes, I am trusting these reviewers with a reviewed by uh, tag. And I am merging this code because I believe it's, it's good. Best, this is a bit far-fetched, sign every single commit. So there is no code that isn't signed. There is no code that, can't, that cannot be 100% attributed to a specific person. That would require having code signatures from any contributor to the project, or you'd have to do squash commits. So you would take all their commits, squash them into, into one, and then sign it yourself, and add the, uh, the, um, uh, uh, the signed off trailer line to say that uh, this, uh, I, I did that. Uh, the, then there is an, the next signed off commit, which is the original author. That's the proper way to do it according to the Git SCM project. If you do not know how signed off by works, then read the fucking manual. Please, come on, you can go to the next slide. Yeah, changing the slide is, is quite... Okay. So now we go to what Marco was saying, how to improve the updates for third-party extensions, because yeah, okay, you have a secure core, but 
What about third-party extensions? Where are we right now? The extension updates share the same issues with the core updates because they share the same updater code. Um, there are people who will willfully and stupidly install Wores, uh, which installs some very nice surprises with them. So yeah, you can find my software uh, for free in a Wores site, but is it really worth getting your site hacked? Because they also pack a, a, a nice C99 script, which automatically uh, also emails the, the attacker and tells them, OK, it's installed there, go hack that site. Um, and this is, this is a true story. I had this person a few months ago, he emailed me, I installed your software and now my site it was immediately hacked. What the fuck? I'm like, uh, I am looking in our database and you are not a subscriber. I cannot find your name anywhere. Are you subscribed as a company or under a different name? He was like, no, no, no. A friend gave it to me. Uh, oh. So I replied, well, you installed Juarez. You tried to steal and you got hacked because the person who distributes the Juarez doesn't do it because he's a nice guy. He still has to pay for all the traffic. How does he make his money? By hacking your site, you idiot. He never replied to me. I don't know why. <laughs> So the threat model of that is the same as installing third-party software to your computer or phone, be it, um, I don't know, uh, Windows, Linux, Mac OS, iOS, whatever, Android. This is a solved problem. Sorry for running late. Um, First of all, you should give choices to the people. This is the same thing, major uh, desktop environments too. You can have a, a three-tiered approach to what people can and cannot install. Uh, you can have the default, which is very secure. If it's not signed, you cannot install it. You're like, no, not signed. You can have the power user setting, which is, hey, this is not signed. Are you sure you want to install? Do you want to get hacked? Yes, no. And of course, there is the uh, YOLO mode developer. Install anything anyway, which is the current situation. So it, it's not that bad, really. It's just terrible. Um, come on. You can do it. Yes. How do you uh, make sure that uh, your extension package uh, is what it claims to be? Zip packages signed the same way that we discussed uh, Joomla update packages are signed. They would be signed by the developer, though, with a developer certificate. How do they get that developer certificate? They get it from, uh, from Joomla, for example, from JED, uh, which acts as an intermediate route. The JED signs the developer certificate, and the developer certificate signs the extension. The XML manifest of the extension developer must also uh, be signed and they must match the canonical name. So when I'm installing Akiba Backup, uh, we should have another attribute in the XML manifest, which is developer Akiba. And that developer name must match the canonical name in the certificate that I, uh, that I claim this extension is signed with which means that I cannot sign Peter's extensions and he cannot sign mine. And of course, while we're installing extensions, we show the user that this extension is signed by this developer. So if someone tries to install Akiba Backup and they see that it's uh, signed by some random company, it will be like, ah, that's, 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 not, that's not real. When you're trying to install updates, the metadata, the, uh, uh, the update streams uh, must also be signed. The XML manifests themselves are also signed. Um, the, so the update XML must have an attribute with uh, the publisher attribute that also matches my canonical name, exactly as we talked about uh, extensions. 
I know that this presentation started late, so now I'm trying to rush a bit through this. So if you have questions about this, you can catch me up later. Um, the goal of all of that, can someone lock the door because it keeps opening? Uh, the, the goal of all that is to make sure that uh, the user knows that when they're installing an extension or an update to that extension, it has come from me and me only. If it's coming from someone else, they, it, it is either blocked or they do it at their own risk and peril. The challenge is to having extensions and extension updates secured is that Joomla or DJD or generally the Joomla organization needs to act as a certificate authority, which means that it needs more staff since it's already understaffed. Um, there is a legal question, how do you verify developer identity? Which information can you collect uh, without overstepping? Uh, what are the legal requirements for storing that information? This is something that you need to contact, with, to contact the lawyers and ask them those questions. Um, how do you handle the certificate revocation? Because for developers, it's going to happen much more often than, uh, than with Joomla itself. Uh, how do you, at, at the code level, it's relatively easy to do that. At the UX level, how, how would you do that? Because a revoked certificate doesn't necessarily mean that this extension developer is a crook. He might revoke his certificate because he fears that his machine was compromised. So how, how do we deal with that? Uh, these are all things that have to be discussed in length. What happens when a certificate uh, expires? If, if uh, someone tries to install an old version of an extension in an old version of Joomla for whatever reason, after the certificate expiration date, how do we handle that? Because back then it was valid, now it's not. This is another issue that needs uh, to be discussed uh, by the community before we decide to implement such a thing. So let's recap. Is providing security for updates worth it? You have less broken sites uh, because you're doing code auditing, you're signing commits, you know what is going into your CMS. You have less hacked sites because unless the code is signed or the user willingly overrides the protection, they cannot install malicious code. This leads to increased client trust to our product. We're basically selling Joomla as the secure CMS, the CMS you can trust. This is a unique selling point. It's something that the other CMSs do not have. And in the end of the day, it's all about social responsibility because social responsibility is why we're all uh, free and open source developers. It is why we're all here instead of working in proprietary software and making millions, hopefully. So Joomla can and must do better. And we all know what Joomla means all together as a whole we can and must do better. So thank you for listening. Uh, you can download the presentation from aki.pa slash sub17. And I have code examples for signing packages at aki.pa slash sub17 code. If you did not have time to take a photo of that slide, you can watch the video, which will be uploaded in like 10 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So thank you very much for listening.